Pierre Bronfman was born into one of the most prominent families in modern history. She had the means to live any way she wanted, anywhere she wanted. But of all the paths she could have taken, she took the path that led to her serving time in federal prison for her leadership role in Nexium. This is how Claire and her sister Sarah poured more than $100 million into one of the most notorious cults of the 21st century. Edgar Bronfman Sr. was the son of Samuel Bronfman, a Russian immigrant who built Seagram's into one of the largest distillers in the world and got rich during Prohibition. Claire and Sarah were the two youngest children of the late billionaire Edgar Bronfman Sr. Edgar Sr. and their mother, Rita Georgiana Webb, divorced for the second time in the 1990s, and the girls spent most of their time living with their mother in the English countryside. Claire was introverted and never finished high school, instead training as a competitive show jumper. Her sister Sarah describes her as being sweet, caring, a little clumsy, and incredibly sensitive. Claire and her sister Sarah grew up on a farm with their mother, but when they turned 18, a trust fund was waiting for each. Sarah says, We were not raised to be heiresses, nor did we understand we would be. We grew up in another world. We were just like everyone else, but then we weren't. Unbeknownst to us, we had millions of dollars awaiting us on our 18th birthdays. In the beginning, Nexium was offering executive coaching classes and appeared to be like other innocuous self-help groups. Edgar Sr. took a course and thought it could benefit both Claire and Sarah, who were struggling to find a purpose in their life. They too enrolled, to the delight of Keith Raniere. But Edgar's enthusiasm waned and became suspicious of Raniere's intentions after realizing that Claire loaned her leader $2 million. It kind of opened up his eyes. Through this loan, he realized, like, oh my God, my daughters might be targeted uh, because of their immense wealth. In 2003, we put Keith Raniere, who's the leader of Nexium, on the cover of Forbes. And the blockbuster quote from that piece is Edgar Bronfman saying, I think it's a cult. What this article looked into is the more strange and concerning behaviors of Keith and certain members of the group. The curtain was drawn back. It was like, this guy is not the smartest man in the world. This group has manipulative tendencies and even its coursework is really concerning. So this article really put Nexium's darker tendencies on the map and um, it, it really put Nexium's story in the mainstream media. The fallout for the story was really on Claire and it indebted her to Keith for their whole relationship. It was this turning point where he finally had something over her. She like owed it to him to try to fix it, but you know, obviously it could never be fixed because the damage was done. Keith made Claire believe that her father had it out for him and that he wanted to destroy Nexium, and that Edgar was part of the Illuminati, you know, like really crazy paranoid things. While Edgar Sr. publicly and privately voiced his suspicions, Claire found a purpose and community within Nexium and refused to part ways with the group. After the Forbes article was published, Claire had spyware installed onto her father's computer to monitor him, according to witness testimony. According to Claire's lawyer, her and her father made up, and she helped take care of him at the end of his life. I think it's easy for us to look at these people who, um, you know, are in news stories being in a cult, and like, how could that ever happen? Like, they must be stupid, and their eyes must be closed. You know, cults don't advertise, like, hey, join us, it's fucking nuts over here. Like, we do insane things, and it's dangerous and scary. It's just a group of like-minded people who want to get along and chat. After time goes on, you realize they cut you off from the world or, you know, tell you, you know, it's not the best to tell your friends what we do here. And then eventually that alienation starts and um, the closest people 
to you in your life are, are people in this group and then it's too late or it's really hard to, to separate because you know you do grow fondness for people that you spend time with. So I think that, to me, that was the most interesting aspect, that it's not hard. Rick Ross, a cult deprogrammer and founder of the Cult Education Institute, defended himself against a 14-year-long lawsuit waged by Keith Raniere and offers his perspective on the group. Nexium targeted celebrities, targeted the wealthy, and these people were conned. Keith Raniere would have imploded a long time before he did if it wasn't for the fact that Claire Bronfman was his bank. She and her sister Sarah were feeding him millions and millions and millions of dollars, including paying for all of his litigation. There was this incredible sucking sound coming out of their bank because the money was being vacuumed into Keith Raniere's coffers to pay for all of his lawyers. Another thing he did that was really interesting, psychologically speaking, um, was Seagram's is a Canadian company. And when the U.S. prohibited alcohol, Seagram's put whiskey distilleries on the border of uh, U.S. and Canada. And their whiskey was fed right into the black market. How Keith spun their fortune was like, your, your fortune is dirty, your fortune is evil, it came from crime, like all this, all this crazy stuff. He said, like, Claire, you need to clean this money and you can clean it through Nexium because we're a, a noble, ethical organization. And Claire bought into that. Claire gave more than $100 million to Nexium over 15 years. A major chunk of her money went towards suing Nexium's enemies, both real and perceived, to smithereens. Sarah eventually left the group, got married, and moved away. She was never charged with any crimes, but Claire remained a devoted member. Over 15 years, it's estimated that Claire hired 50 to 60 lawyers to pursue cases against nearly a dozen Nexium critics. At least three people who defended themselves against Nexium's aggressive legal strategy eventually filed for personal bankruptcy protection. Barbara Boucher joined Nexium in 2001 and was one of its earliest executive board members. She dated Keith for many years. She also owned a successful financial planning company, becoming Claire and Sarah's financial advisor and managed a small portion of their wealth. Boucher was the first person to sound the alarm on the unethical practices within the group and eventually left the group. After her departure, Keith went after her in both civil and criminal court over the duration of the next eight years. 14 litigations, four states, eight judges. There were thousands of court filings and Barbara spent almost a million dollars defending herself. Ultimately, all charges against Barbara were dropped. It's been 20 years of my life and it's taken a toll on my body and my nervous system and I still have a lot of post-traumatic stress. Keith used Claire's money as a reign of terror within the organization. If it were not for Claire Brothman, he would have never been able to have done any of that and probably would have been brought down a hell of a lot sooner than he was. So Claire's very responsible. She played a key role. The tipping point was the day the New York Times published their article about DOS, a secretive group within Nexium. Federal investigators then arrested Keith Raniere on charges of racketeering, sex trafficking, conspiracy, forced labor, identity theft, sexual exploitation of a child, and possession of child pornography. A few months later, Claire Bronfman was indicted and charged with a racketeering conspiracy, including identity theft, extortion, forced labor, sex trafficking, money laundering, wire fraud, and obstruction of justice. Bronfman made a deal with prosecutors and only pled guilty to identity theft and immigration fraud, and was sentenced to 81 months in prison. Ranieri was convicted on all charges and will spend the rest of his life in prison. Probably one of the saddest things that came about through the trial was this email exchange between Claire and her father. Edgar writes, whether or not you want to believe me, I do not lie, and I love you too very much. Someone is not telling you the truth. Why don't you try and figure out who that might be? 
Who has something to gain? Certainly not me. What would be my motive? And then he signs off, tons of love, even if not requited, pops. Keith saw a rift in a family dynamic and he exploited it for his own personal gain. She justified it for the greater good. And that is the crime because Keith can influence her all he wants. People can say she was brainwashed and unduly influenced. And I beg to differ. It's Claire who chooses to pick up that sword. And that's why she's a criminal. She knew it was wrong and she did it anyway. I really do think that there is goodness in her. I've seen it, I know it. And I believe that she, in the end, wants to do right and wants to be a humanitarian. She is a woman with wealth, powers, and means to fix the wrongs, which most people would never have that kind of ability to do so. She could turn this around and become, you know, quite the story down the road.